Yes, because all of these giants center from, everybody knows the story of David versus Goliath, right? Or David and Goliath. Everybody talks about that story. It's the most popular, it's probably the most popular story in the Bible. Uh, you know, if you compared it to Noah's Ark, that's another one. Uh, but David and Goliath, but there's so many pictures there. And I had to, I had to really discipline myself not to preach out that entire chapter because because I'm focusing on the giants, but there's so much there that you want to just, there's so much to glean there that you could stay on that for a long time. But I tried to discipline myself because I want to teach you about these giants because we were talking about them in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, you know, if you turn to your Bibles there. Now, we're not going to be in Genesis chapter 6. We are actually going to be all over in Chronicles and, the, the, and Samuel today. And the reason for that is because of the the giants show up again and I, I think there's some awesome pictures that we need to remember here uh, and it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose so the Bible talks about uh, those, those sons of uh, God and daughters of men verse number 4 says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that well, this is the end also after that. And I think it's absolutely fascinating uh, because of the typology that's here. Remember, David is a type of Christ. David is a prophet, a priest, and a king. He is all three of those things. He's a type of Christ. And he was the, one of the best pictures in the Old Testament uh, of being a type of Christ. Except to prove his, his humanity and his manhood, the Bible shows his failures, right? Right? The Bible shows that later on with Bathsheba that he would fail, that he would fall. The life of David is fascinating. It really is. And someday maybe we'll preach all the way through the life of David. That would be fun. There's so much there, so many teachings there and so much truth there. But the Bible never shows Christ failing because Christ never failed. Amen. Every type of Christ in the Old Testament all the way through failed in some way or would fail, right, in a person. But when you come to the New Testament, you come to Christ who never failed. Amen? Because he is God manifest in the flesh. And God could not fail. God cannot fail. Amen? Well, you know, the stories of David and Goliath, I mean, the stories of giants, period. But Goliath is probably the most famous giant. He is probably, hands down, the most famous giant. Now, uh, we're gonna, we'll get into that here. Uh, Goliath was from Gath. I think that's interesting, and I'm going to show you the scripture for that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, help us now as we look through the scriptures, as we study this thing of the giants, Lord, and see how these things apply to our lives. Help us to apply these things uh, to our lives. There's so many lessons you have for us. Thank you, Jesus, for them. Amen. Uh, Goliath was from Gath. That's important to remember. Gath is mentioned 33 times in the King James Bible, which is another interesting number. Uh, which has to do with that Antichrist, you know, picture that Antichrist number, the mocking of Jesus, right? That's what that is. That number 33 is a mocking of Christ, right? Christ was here 33 and a third of his life, and then he died, right? He gave his life in the prime of his life. 33 is of a normal man's life is the prime of their life. It is showing that Christ wasn't decrepit. He could have fought them off. You know, he wasn't, Christ willingly gave himself, right? He right. wasn't a foolish young man at that right. point. Uh, or anything like that. He never was a foolish young man, but he wasn't like the world as, as a picture of that. But it shows that he was of age, that he was, he was in his prime, and he gave his life, right? But the, the devil and his kingdom mock that number. They, they like to mock that, just like they mock 13. 13 is the love of God, right? We find that love of God in that number 13, but for the lost, it's their rebellion, you know? And anyway, but Goliath is mentioned also six times in the King James Bible. By name, he is mentioned six times. Now, there's a history here that's important. Where did Goliath come from? Joshua chapter 11 uh, tells us, right? It shows us right here, Joshua chapter 11, verse number 20. And at that time, Joshua, at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains and from Hebron and from Deber and from Anab and, all, and from all the mountains of Judah and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod, they remained. 
So the history of the giants, Goliath would have been an Anakim. That's where he came from. He's of the descendants of the Anakims because those Anakims rested in Gath and Gaza. They joined uh, a confederacy with the Philistines. The Philistines hated God, right? Well, who better to have for your champion than a giant that was brought into existence out of hatred for God? right? That lineage of the giants, they hated God. You know, a picture of the natural man also, you know, Goliath, that number six is a picture of man and beast, right? Uh, that, that's that mixture, that 666 is a mixture of man and beast together. But these Anakims, they would settle, they would leave what, whoever was left of them, and only in Gaza and Gath and Ashdod did they remain. So that's where they ended up moving to. So see, that's why people ask about post-flood, pre-flood giants, all these questions. Who was a giant? Who wasn't? Well, these we know for sure. We can trace the lineage of them, right? From, from the Anakims and, and how they were near Hebron and they rested there. Now here's a map right here. Here's Gath right here. Here's Bethlehem, Judah right around here. Here you have Jerusalem right here. Here you have the Valley of Sorek. Who remembers what's famous in the Valley of Sorek? Who was in, who, who was in the Valley of Sorek? Samson was in the Valley of Sorek. Samson went down to the Valley of Sorek to find a wife, to find a woman. I think it was Delilah he found in the Valley of Sorek. Now remember, the Philistines have always been enemies of God. By the way, God always has enemies. The children of God always have enemies. You always will have enemies. As soon as you were saved by the grace of God, as soon as you were, there are, you are surrounded by enemies. That's just, that's your life. And you need to understand that. Some of you have to remember that that's the Christian life. You're given armor, not so you can look at the mirror in it and take selfie pictures on Facebook with it, right? Not so you can be vainly say, hey, I'm in an army. I've got my uniform. I've got all these things and, and all that. No, you, you got armor to fight. You've got armor because you have enemies. You have armor because you're surrounded and there are giants all over the land. And some of you are looking for a vacation and there ain't one here. Your vacation in that sense is no vacation from, from spiritual warfare. And you say, sometimes it feels like it's so ramped up. Well, of course it is. How can grace be tested if grace is never tested? No, you don't understand, preacher. I'm never, my faith is never supposed to be challenged. I'm never supposed to have giants come after me. And I'm never supposed to feel inferior. And I'm never supposed to have all those. Uh, I'm never supposed to look around and see like, feel like a grasshopper in the land. I'm, I'm supposed to be the giant. And I'm supposed to feel mighty. And I'm supposed to feel great. No, you're supposed to trust God. <laughs> you're to put your armor on because you're in a fight. And some, and you know what, right now in your life, some of you, you're, you're, the different pieces of your armor are being tested. They're being tested. Those different pieces of it. So, you, you know, maybe, maybe you're pretty, maybe you're equipped with one portion of that armor, but maybe some of the others you're not. So then in the fire, those other portions of that armor are tested. You know, David's faith was tested constantly. Okay, here's another thing I want you to think about. David being a picture, a type of Christ. All the giants in the land were gone at this point, at this point of David's life, except right here in this area. Here's Jerusalem, here's Bethlehem, here's Gath, right? So all the giants are gone, but who's going to, Joshua never finished destroying all the giants. They rested over here with the Philistines, right? Christ will come, or David, a type of Christ, will come, and he will destroy the giants. After David destroys the giants, there are no more. They are eradicated. They are done. They are gone with. They are done with. And we'll talk about that at the end. But that's a picture for you. That means that you and I, all through our life, we're going we're gonna to face giants. Like, you're not going to get out of that. You're not going to get out of having your faith tested. You're not, it, it must be tested in the fire. Over all doubts, over all fears, fears, over all trials, over all tribulations, over all heartaches, over all pains, over all sufferings, and eventually death, which is the final. I, I brother Scott, uh, we, I, brother Gary Long, Pastor Gary Long, um, a, pa a pastor down in Springfield that passed away 
last year. He went home to be with the Lord. It's funny. Uh, he left me, before he died, he left a couple book booklets that were from Brother Wolliver, who was his publisher, and he put my name on them, and he said he wanted them, me to have those. And she got a hold of me, and I didn't get back in touch with her. Brother Scott did get in touch with him down there, and, and we, we got them sent to us. And But they... He left these books, and one of the things they talked about was the death of some of those saints and how they described it. They went on to victory, they would say. They went on, they triumphed in death. You know what I mean? They were talking about, their, and it was in their obituaries. They, they, they said they were sad to see them go, but they finally triumphed in death. But death is a triumph for you and I. Amen. It, it's victory. It's not defeat. We don't, when we die, when, when we draw our last breath here, that's not defeat. Oh my, that's victory. That's victory. Amen. So anyway, here, here David is going to come into the land, and David's going to finish as the type of Christ. He's going to finish what Joshua started, what Moses started. Check that, check that out, okay? Moses is a picture of the law, right? Moses is the law, right? Joshua took them into the land. David, the type of Christ, which is grace, is going to conquer over them. Amen? Same thing today. The same thing you have today with us. Christ will conquer all of our enemies. It's him that does it. But you and I have to fight. Now, these guys are ugly. Remember these guys? Boy, are they ugly. I like that guy's head right there. I think I'm related to him. Anyway, I'm just kidding. But, uh, uh, yeah, the goon, yeah. Uh, these were the children of Anak. That's where they came from. That's who these people, that's who these giants were. They were children of Anak. Numbers 13, 22, and they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, whereas Ahimon, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak were. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Remember, we talked about that last week. They are the giants in that portion. Joshua 15, 14, and Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, right? So we see that he drove the children of Anak away. This tells us that they were, number one, again, capable of reproducing, that there must have been some kind of female giants. We're not, they're not reckoned in any genealogies, but the reason for that is most of the time, women were not reckoned in genealogies. There are only a few women in all the Old Testament that were reckoned in genealogies, because the purpose, the seed always followed the man, right? That's, that's what was always talked about. The lineages of women were not, they were hidden men. That's, that's how they described it. So th it's not unusual that they wouldn't have described that. There's only a few certain women. Um, when you get into the Old Testament, you understand the tribes when they're giving the land. There were some daughters that were listed. And the reason why is all their male uh, brothers and si all their male brothers and died. And they were to get their And they said, are we going to lose our father's inheritance because we're not men? And, Jesus, and, and Joshua, a type of Christ, said, no, you're not going to lose. You, 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 don't, you don't lose your inheritance because you're not a man, your fa that he was your father, right? So, you know, that's a lesson for you ladies here, that God's still your father. You may not have one here, you may not have a husband, but God's your father. And you don't lose anything just because you don't have a man here on earth to be a covering for you, right? You don't lose anything. The problem is, is you've got to go to your heavenly father. You've got to, you've got to, You've got to love him and you've got to be devoted to, to your father in heaven. You've got to seek his face. If you don't have a father on this earth, then you, you know, you, you've got to seek your father in heaven. And if, even if you do have a father on this earth, you've got to seek your father in heaven more than anyone. All of us do. But that's a lesson for you ladies. That God, hasn't, God has not left you without love. But I dare say that you sometimes have left your first love. And you've been distracted by other things. Goliath had to be a descendant of the sons of Enoch because that's where they settled. We're not told which of the sons. I think it's interesting. I did a little bit of research uh, on a timeline. From Samson to, uh, to David was about 120 years. And we don't find any giants talked about during that time period, which I thought was interesting. Samson never faced those giants at all, and Samson fought the Philistines. He fought them a lot. I, there's a reason for that, though. Remember, Samson had enormous strength. God didn't want to use Samson to do that. God wanted to use David to do that, right? 
David being a type of Christ, David, which we're going to get into, the complete opposite of a Samson, right? In that strength-wise, in that David's strength was trusting in the Lord. By the way, you as a Christian, your strength is in trusting in the Lord. Your strength is not in the power of your own might. It's not, it's not by might nor by power, but by God's Spirit. It's God's Spirit that gives, remember, it's God's Spirit that gives us strength as a child of God. If you're going to face any warfare in this Christian life, if you're going to fight the giants, right, if you're going to do that, then guess what you have to do? You've got to trust the Lord. You're going to have to trust God. You're going to have to let Christ be your all. Amen? Now, here's this ugly guy again. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. Now, I'm going to show you some figures here uh, about how big Goliath was. Uh, standard cubits... I don't think are correct. Uh, Matthew Henry, as well as a few others, say that they don't believe that they, they, they minimize these giants by a couple feet, is what Matthew Henry says. Uh, Goliath especially. All right? They do. Uh, now, let's talk about champions, first of all. Champion is three times in the King James Bible. Look at the definition of a champion. A man who undertakes a combat in the place or cause of another. A hero. A brave warrior, hence one who is bold in contest. I think you ought to be careful who you look up to and who your heroes are. You know, this world makes heroes out of every athlete, every muscle-bound freak that's out there, every, every worldly figure, right? They make uh, out of presidents, out of all these people, they make heroes out of people that really should not be anyone's hero, right? right? They don't, they, right, they make, right, they, they make it out of... Uh, all of these people, like I, I listened to, uh, you know, some of the things between Putin and the other president over there in, in, in the Ukraine and some of their talk and the things that they said. None of them give any glory to God. They were like, for the glory of Ukraine. Right? That's, well, then that's why he's fighting. Right? That's for the glory of men. That's why. Well, we fight for the glory of God. Our warfare is spiritual, not carnal. Our, our warfare is, uh, they're, they're champions, they're heroes, right? The world teaches children that they ought to look up to these certain people, right? But God doesn't tell us that. God shows us who we're to look up to, and it's, it's, and you should have earthly, you should have people that you look up to. By the way, if, if we were not to be examples to our children, then they right. shouldn't look, th then why would God tell us to right. be examples of them? Right. So your, your, our children look up to each other, uh, uh, their parents and their family members, right? Amen. Right? That's who your children, by the way, your children, you should have more of an impact on your children Amen. than any of this world out there. And you grandparents ought to have more of an impact Amen. on your grandchildren. They ought to look up to you and they ought to see faithfulness. Amen. They ought to remember that faithfulness. Amen. That's what they ought to look at. Yeah, we're all going to have flaws. Even, even David, the man after God's own heart, he had some flaws, right? Yeah. But his manner of life Amen. in general was something to look up to. Amen. Right? He loved the Lord. And he repented when he was wrong. You children, be careful who you think you want to be like That's when you right. grow up. Amen. When you look at the world and you look at what they do and, and, and everything else, you be careful. Right? Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 shows us uh, the heroes of the faith, right? Those that we're to look up to, right? And then, by the way, Christ trumps all of them, right? Because the Bible, the, the, the theme of Hebrews is Christ better than all, right? Amen. Amen. But we want to look up. I, you know what? You and I ought to live our lives, the men in this room, we ought to live our lives to where these children have someone to look up to. Amen. Right? We ought to. We're going to fail, but you know what? Children will forgive your failures when you tell them, when you confess them and you repent to them. They will forgive you. They will forgive you. They can't help it. They just, it's, it's how we're made. Most people in general will. It's just most people in general will. They, they just honestly will. They, they, it's hard for them to resist that. When somebody comes to them humbly, it's hard for them to resist that humility. That's how God made us, right? Total depravity and all. 
Right, exactly. That's right. It's God put that in us, right? He put that in us to do that. That's how we're made in his image, even though we're fallen, right? And we fell from that. But that's why we need Christ, just like every one of these men needed Christ. The Bible shows you that all these men, as good as they were in any way, all needed Christ. Amen. And just like you and I, right? No different. But we ought to be the men that these children can look up to, that we invest in their lives, that we teach them. And you ladies ought to be ladies that these young daughters can look up to, that they can respect, that they can love and admire and appreciate, that they had godly women in their life that loved them. Amen. You mothers, you have to understand how vitally important that it is for you to be the, the, the champions or the heroes in your, in your daughter's lives, right? Godly women. Right? That aren't ashamed of what they believe. Right? Amen? Amen. And a wife, a, a husband ought to live in such a way that, that, that her husband could be her hero and should be. Amen. That's not being vain either. Amen. That isn't. And, a, you know, that they, they, they look, that's not. That's called being something to, to be an example. That's why the Bible tells us to be examples. Right? right? I mean, what does a bad example do? It leads people astray. It hurts people, right? What's a good example do? It leads them to, to emulate that, to follow that, right? It's not an accident that fathers in the home and mothers in the home change the way the children are raised. That's, right. it's not, that's not an accident. Right. It, it has an impact, right? There, there, that God did that. That's, why, that's because it's God's way, right? And now you're, anyway, and your duty now, if you didn't live like that, is to do it now. And to invest in the next generation to help them do it. Amen. See how what this is going to go too long? That's Amen. how it happens. It's just preaching. I keep Good. preaching through these notes. And look at this ugly guy. Um, anyway, he's one of the most famous guys. His name is the he, his name is um, Dwayne Johnson. They call him the Rock. And I put this in there on purpose because he's a type of antichrist. He is what the world wants. Yeah. I mean, he has more Twitter followers than anyone. Yeah. I, he's the number one person, right? He has hundreds of millions of people that follow him and emulate his life. And to me, he's like a sod, to be honest with you. I think he's a, he's, a, he, but he calls himself by a few different names, right? He calls himself the people's champion. Well, he does emulate what the people want. That's what they want. They want somebody on steroids, somebody that's jacked up like that, somebody that lives their life like that, right? Somebody that, that emulates who they are. That's, what, that's a modern-day Goliath, if you will. That's a modern-day champion. He calls himself the rock when Jesus is the rock. Amen. Right? He calls himself the people's champion, which is Antichrist, which is Goliath. That's the people's champion, right? That's who, that's, that's who that is. That's who, they, who he was. He calls himself the great one. Jesus Christ is the great one. He calls himself the Brahma Bull, which is, a, by the way, a picture of that Baphomet anti. I mean, you can't get any more. He might as well wear a shirt, I'm the Antichrist. I mean, he might as, I mean, everything that he emulates, but that's what's popular. That's what the world wants. Yeah, yeah logic would tell you he wouldn't be able to drum up half a dozen followers on Twitter. Right. Who, who would even care? But, the, but there's hundreds <laughs> of millions of people that follow him. Hundred and he's and he's worth half a billion dollars. Right. Right? He's like a modern day Goliath. That's what the world wants. That's what the world is gonna choose over Christ. Yes. That is what they're gonna choose. That's who they're gonna choose. And we'll show you that in the life of David right now, when David faced the giants, right? Consider the description of David versus what you just saw. So here's what you here's what you just saw, not him. Him, right? Here's a big guy. Looks like Andre the Giant, right? Then you have what, what was said about David. And we'll get to a few verses about that. But he says, thou art but a youth. That's what Saul said to him. I mean, you're just, he's a little, the Bible calls a stripling. Look what the definition of that is. Primarily a tall, slender youth, one that shoots up suddenly. A youth in the state of adolescence or just passing from boyhood to manhood. He's a lad. He was a boy. So I, I tried to do kind of a comparison. And Lucius is a good comparison of like a body frame of what like um, 
what, what David would have been, right? Slender, um, not tall, not super tall, because David wasn't, right? Average size, very just not real muscular bound or anything like that. Just a thin, a thin younger boy, right? That's kind of how David was. That's how his body frame was, just like that. And I, I looked at the top of my, uh, of the roof of uh, my uh, transit, and that's about nine feet. But only when I did some more figuring, Goliath was over nine feet. Actually, a lot of people say nine foot nine cubits, but really, no, Goliath was 11 four or 11 two to 11 four. And I'm going to show you those figures. So you think about that, right? Goliath is that big, and David is that small. Right? They called him, his brother called him like that little shepherd boy, right? His brother said, I know the naughtiness of thine heart, little boy. Now, his brother had a reason for that, which we'll get to. But God said something to Samuel a, f a chapter before that before 1 Samuel 17, when he was going to anoint David. This is a typical warrior, right? And uh, 1 Samuel 16, And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's, an the Lord anointed, the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So Eliab was mad at David still. And I, you can't blame him. I mean, he's his older brother, right? I mean, his older brother, he got skipped over. And, and the younger brothers out tending a few sheep in the field, right? Little skinny brothers out there tending the sheep in the field, those few sheep that he had, right? And he doesn't get anointed, but David, it, the smallest, scrawniest one, is the one that gets anointed to be the king the next king of Israel. But the Bible tells us that the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, right? 1 Samuel 16, 12, And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So David, remember, he's the one that killed the lion and the bear out in the out uh, that were attacking his sheep. They were the one. David was the little shepherd boy, right? He's just a shepherd boy. He's not very big. He's not nothing impressive. But God said, "That's the one." See, God looks on the heart. That's what God does. Man will look at at. And by the way, you do the same thing when you're in a fight or you're in a battle against the odds. You are looking at the stature of your enemies. You are looking at the stature. You're looking at the cost of some bill that you have. You're looking at the, 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 the size of the cancer. You're looking at how big your obstacles are before you. God says, no. God looks on the heart. See, God, the Bible says that God searched out, God told Saul to tell Samuel, Saul to tell Samuel that, that I have a man, that I've found a man after mine own heart. And you're done, Saul. You're done. I'm not, I'm not going to any more deal with you. And God didn't. And God rejected Saul because Saul rejected the Lord. Right? So God sends Samuel to go anoint. God, God told Samuel was in a really depressed mood because of Saul. I mean, he wept all night and he said, how long are you going to weep? Get up off your, get up on your feet and get down to uh, take your, take your uh, horn and anoint a horn of oil and go anoint a king of one of the sons of Jesse. Now, by the way, David was the eighth son of Jesse. Eight is that number of regeneration of new things because God was getting ready to do something new. In, and David, being a type of Christ, was going to fulfill that. David was going to rout out the giants. He was going to destroy them. He was going to, he was going to finish them, right? And that's exactly what he did. You know, oftentimes heroes are not how you imagine them to be. 
you imagine a hero, you imagine in your mind what, what Hollywood movies and other things promote as heroes. You imagine something, someone big and muscular. You imagine someone that is mighty themselves and, and all those things. But heroes are those like we find in the Bible. David, Gideon, the Hebrew midwives, King Josiah, right? Little, little as much when God is in it, we sing that song, right? They weren't mighty in their stature. In fact, when God called some kings and he anointed them king, he said, he said, you know, you were fine when you were little in your own eyes. Right? When you knew you couldn't do anything. Guess what? You were fine in your spiritual walk too when, when you were little in your own eyes. When you're humble, you're, fi you're fine. God's going to take care of you. But as soon as you get proud and arrogant, and as soon as you believe like it's your duty to to do everything and it's because of something in you that's so great, right? As soon as you get that way, then God's going to humble you and show you that it never was in you. Like it never was you. It was always me. That's how heroes really are. God makes heroes. God likes to take the despised things of this world and he likes to, he likes to take them and have them defeat the giants. That's what he did with David. He, he likes to take, remember, Saul is head and shoulders over everyone in Israel. But David's heart was bigger than all of them. The Apostle Paul's appearance, remember him? The Apostle Paul's appearance in his speaking ability was contemptible, right? People said, ah, oh, he's not much when you, go, when you look at him. Right? He wasn't much to, to, uh, to look at. Now, there's a description that's given. Goliath, like we talked about, is mentioned. His name is mentioned six times. We talked about six being the number of man and the beast, and Goliath is that type of Antichrist. We talk about his helmet. We talk about his, his bronze-scaled coat of mail, which we're going we're gonna to show you some figures on that. His sword, his spear, his greaves to protect those legs, right? Because he's tall, right? So if he doesn't have some, something on to protect those legs, he can get chopped down, right? Real easy, or, or easier target that is but he didn't protect the one spot right between there <laughs> that one spot right why because that's how God works that one little spot right there right he had armor for everything man he was covered with everything but without Christ you're not covered without the Lord covering you you're not covered amen, amen? you never will be here's the tale of the tape he was six cubits in a span. 9.9 .9 feet tall is what the, what, the, what the average people say. I believe he was bigger than that. Okay, I believe he was 11.4, and I'll show you the figures that Matthew Henry talks about, right? But still not as big as Anak, I don't believe. I believe those sons of Anak, I believe Anak and those others were bigger than him. I think years went by, and I think they probably, like everything else, they got smaller, you know, their stature, their years, and everything else. Uh, not as tall as his giant relatives, I believe. I believe uh, Og, king of Bashan, was bigger than that. You know, probably a little bit bigger than that. But I, I also want you to understand here, and, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you a little bit of a video here, a few little videos here. And the reason I want to show you this is because I want you to understand that this is not gigantism. Right. This is not a pituitary gland problem. Do you understand why that's important? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, we're going to show a picture here of Robert Wadlow pretty soon. Yeah. Um, yeah, think about this. He's a warrior. Okay, this is a picture of a giant warrior. Just an image of one. A giant warrior, right? And, and look at his muscle, strength, agility, power. Um, there, he wasn't weak. Okay, it's not, you're not dealing with a weak man. Uh, a weak, uh, sickly man that had a pituitary problem that made him grow gigantic in size, but very weak, and you watch him walk and they're like, well, I'll show you Robert Wadlow. I'll show you him, who was a, a gentle giant, right, they called him. And, and he was very weak and sickly, right? And he had gigantism, and he died at a very, 22 years old or something like that, he died. Well, that's not these guys. That's not who they were. But what, what, what modern-day evolutionists will try to tell you is, oh, that's what these guys were just, they, they must have had gigantism. That's how some people explain away the miracles of the Bible and things like that. Well, it must have been, because you can't talk about fallen angels. And you can't talk about, because then there's a spirit world, 
right? And then there's actually, maybe that Bible is true and there's really a kingdom and Satan has a kingdom and he's deceiving the whole world and he's the God of this world and he actually hates God and you're actually in the middle of a war between God and the devil. And man has been used by Satan as a pawn to fight against God, right? And those giants that were in the earth, they must have been just, they must have had a pituitary gland problem, must have been something like that. Uh, no, they were not, these were warriors. These were not weak, sickly people that were, that walked around and did tours in Barnum and Bailey's circus. And I'm not being unkind to Robert Wadlow. I'm just saying that's what, that's who he was. He was a very nice man from everything everybody said, you know, uh, but, but that's, that's what he was. He was very sickly and weak. These men were warriors. They were out on the front lines of battle and they hated God. And they killed many men, and people were deathly afraid of them, which I'll, I'll show you a reason why in a second. Matthew Henry says about his size, he said, about Goliath, he says, His prodigious size, he was of the sons of Anak, who at Gath kept their ground in Joshua's time, and kept up a race of giants there, of which Goliath was one, and, and it is probable one of the largest. He was in height six cubits and a span. The learned Bishop Cumberland has made it out that the scripture cubit was above 21 inches, above three inches more than our half yard, and a span was half a cubit, by which, a, uh, which computation Goliath wanted but eight inches of four yard in height, 11 feet and four inches, a monstrous stature, and which made him very formidable, especially if he had strength and spirit proportionable. So I want you to think about that. You think about a man... Like, you've seen pictures, some of you of Andre the Giant and different people like that, big girth, wide man, huge man, seven, he was seven four. Four feet taller than seven four. Eleven four. So, by the way, if you go back and you use these measurements for Og, king of Bashan, his bed was probably 15 to 16 feet long. Because he was probably 13 feet long himself, tall himself. But why do they want to change that? Well, because they want to be really conservative with those numbers. Right. By the way, which would change some of the things even with the Ark of the Covenant probably, or not the Ark of the Covenant, but the Ark and all those measurements of things. It would change all those measurements a little bit uh, because we would be going by biblical cubits, which would be bigger, so the Ark would be bigger than what most people think it, it was, right? Yeah. There you go, which I believe because I believe things were bigger. For a reason. And when you find things in history, uh, the cities of Bashan, different places like that, which we'll talk about in, when we talk about giants and archaeological structures and things. Yep. Reason for that, <clears throat> when the cubit was set back in, in those days, people in general were bigger, mm -hmm. especially prior to the flood. Uh, we've lost genes. As yes. Gone on. We've become smaller. So a cubit has always been elbow to tip. Well, we're smaller, so that's why a current cubit is 18. Right. Whereas when it was actually set a cubit, he'd be absolutely correct. Right. And there's also a difference between like royal cubits correct. and things of that nature. I think a royal cubit might be the one that was three inches bigger, which is what the Bible, the Bible speaks of. But I thought it was fascinating because Matthew Henry, who's a very conservative person when it comes to those kind of things, would, I mean, very conservative when it comes to like, uh, you know, talking about that, uh, numbers and things. And just in general, he's a, he's like John Gill, very conservative uh, commentator when it comes to things. Now, Goliath's armor. We're going to talk about that a little bit here. 1 Samuel 17, 5. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spearheads weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him. Well, how much does that weigh? Coat of mail, 126 pounds. So Lucius weighs about 126 pounds, I think. So that'd be like strapping, like you know how we, we strap those babies on our backs, right? And put them in backpacks and they weigh like, I don't know what, like 15 pounds or 20 pounds, 20 pounds, 20 pounds, right? 20 pounds, put them on your backpack, right? Put them on there and you strap the baby, you're going climbing on mountains. Well, that'd be like that'd be like me strapping Lucius on my back and carrying him around like that 
up mountains, right? That's what his coat of, of, of mail weighed. 126 pounds. That's what, a, that's what some boys weigh, right? Some young men weigh, right? 126 pounds. His spearhead, 12 to 15 pounds. Throw one of those around. Ouch. Right? Here's another, just a coat of mail, just to give you an idea. That's, that's kind of, it was, to, it was a protectant, right? It was like a breastplate. It was a protectant for them. He had on also a target. By the way, this is uh, the Creation Museum. Uh, somebody made this for them. It's a depiction of Goliath's spear. How tall it would be, how big it would be. So look, here's an average man, 6'1", probably, 6 foot 6'1". Look how big that spear is. Could you imagine that? Right? You're, <laughs> he's carrying that spear. So he says like a weaver's beam. <laughs> right? Whew. Throwing that with the tip of that weighing 15 pounds. Could you imagine that? <laughs> 15 pounds coming at you with that with that spear hitting you. What's an average one weigh? Like a pound or two, maybe? You know? Uh, yeah, this is 12 to 15 pounds and the height of it. And here he is holding this, right? He's just carrying this off into battle. And you're, facing, you're standing in the valley of Sorek or in the valley there. You're standing there and on the opposite sides of the valley, you know, they're in between the valleys, the valley on, on each side. And, and here's Goliath screaming at you, you know, from, and his voice. I'm going to try to show you. We have a little bit of something that will give you an idea. But it's not somebody screaming, but it's somebody talking. The depth of the voice. Because you have to understand something. When, when you and I, when you and I are the size that we are of average human beings, right? Average size, our voice is equipped to the size that we have. So the bigger someone is, the deeper their throat is, the deeper the decibels go, right? The deeper their voice would be. And their chest cavity is so much larger and bigger that they, had, they have more room to scream. You ever seen like uh, those big singers and they're, they're big men, right? And they, they have wide chest and they sing and they just bellow it out. Well, imagine, imagine an 11 foot giant with a chest like this wide, right? And his chest is like that wide and he, twice of a normal man's size in width, right? And he's, he's standing on the other side of the valley and he's screaming at you in that, in that valley where everything is like louder, right? Like if you were going to preach in there and you're like, whoa, and it's like you could hear it. And he's screaming at you. Imagine being those, those Israelites over there, right? Saul had lost all nerve. Saul is done. Yep. He doesn't have any nerve left. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and, and God was no longer with Saul. So Saul is afraid, right? Saul is terrified of what's going on. He's hanging out under the tree, right? He's, he's, he's all but given up. Then you have other men that are there. Think about this. Think about the mighty men that were there at the time. You have Jonathan, but the Bible never records Jonathan standing up and doing anything. Jonathan slew 20 or 30 men by himself or, you know, a whole brigade of men that God he rose up. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he just slew a bunch of them, right? But God didn't use him. How about Abner? You have Abner, the captain of the host, right? That was Saul's capital. Abner was a mighty warrior, but Abner didn't stand up. Why? Well, because God always has his man for the hour. God chose David. That's why God wanted David to stand up, and he was doing it for a reason. Yes. It wasn't going to be by might nor by, by right. power, but by his spirit, right? It was going to be, it was going to be God said, I'm going to use the smallest boy. I'm going to bring him out, right. and I'm going to use him, and I'm going to make him king, and I'm going to use him to defeat everyone in front of all of Israel, in front of all the Philistines, in front of all the devils, right? Which is a picture of Christ, because when Christ came, he's the meek and lowly one, right? And they looked at him and they despised him. Yep. <clears throat> Look at that dude. He is a modern day giant. He's very tall. Andrew, did it say how tall he was? Uh, eight foot 11. This guy is? Yeah. You've seen this guy before too? Yeah, I was studying him for okay. okay, okay, here we go. I'm going to play that now, okay? Oops. Intenta llevar una vida lo más normal posible. Güey, en, aquí en la casa pongo la mesa, 
quito la mesa, doblo la ropa, la reparto, la ropa que está planchada, la, la reparto, ayudo mucho a mi mamá, cuido a mi abuelita. Javier mide 2 metros con 35 centímetros, por lo que necesita una cama especial. Por lo que necesita una cama especial. Okay, so that's good. I just I wanted you to see that. I wanted you to see that because or listen to that because it gives you an idea of the depth of the voice. So and he's not like you could tell. I mean, do you see his hand? His hand was bigger than his dad's head. Like his dad's sitting off the side, and he could just like palm his dad's head and be like, I mean, it was huge, right? It's humongous. Well. Anyway, the point is that that guy was a sickly guy. You know, he's in a chair. He's not, he's not that well, right? But listen to the voice. It's really deep. Now, imagine a warrior, one that's a fighter, yeah. and one that's like screaming across that valley right. at Israel. I mean, honestly, I mean, it would make any man want to like pee their pants in fear, right? I mean, you would just be like, oh, my goodness, what was that? Just hearing that, David comes up on the scene and he's like, David could probably hear it for like, <laughs> what is that noise? You could hear it bellowing. Like you hear how, okay, you hear how street preachers can be really loud. Like Paul's pretty loud, right? Paul can be pretty loud. And Jeremy Sonier is one of the loudest street preachers I ever heard, right? Very loud and their voice echoing off stuff. And you could hear them off across buildings and everything like that, right? Imagine this guy screaming at you with that deep voice and he's mad and he hates God and he hates them. It's terrifying. I mean, it would be, I can understand why they were afraid, can't you? Yeah, because it's like, yeah, it's like thundering out. Very frightening. This is Robert Wadlow. Now, Robert Wadlow was who they call the gentle giant, okay? Um, he had that uh, pituitary problem, I believe it was, or something like that, some kind of problem uh, that, that caused that. Now, I want to show you, this is him, and this is an average size boy, right? And this is, this is him. Now, we're going to show you this video, okay? And just a little bit of it. I want you to get an idea of this is gigantism. That's not what Goliath was. I'm showing you that in a comparison so you understand that here's this big guy, and he's huge, right? But he's not muscular. He's not, like, super strong and powerful and full of agility, right? I'm Jim Kircher, and this, of course, is the statue. I'm Jim Kircher, and this, of course, is a statue of Robert Wadlow, the world's tallest man, born here in Alton a hundred years ago in February of 1918. He was so amazingly tall, it's easy to forget that this is a statue of a real person. In so many other ways, Robert Wadlow was a regular guy, or at least somebody who was trying to be a regular guy. One of the few places he could really do that was here in his hometown. He was known as the Alton Giant because of a pituitary gland condition that could be treated today. He grew to nearly nine feet tall, and Robert Wadlow went into the record books as the world's tallest man. But he died at the age of 22, so for most of his life, he was a growing boy. Wherever he went, here he is at age 15 with the YMCA group at the Chicago World's Fair. He couldn't help but attract cameras and crowds, which then became his job with St. Louis's International Shoe Company. He traveled from town to town, shoe store to shoe store. But he did consider it a job. He considered it a full-time job. His title was field representative for International Shoe. Tim Leone produced a documentary about Robert Wadlow's life in 1991. He tracked down the photos and the films. He interviewed those who had known him. And he talked with us about what he found. And just uh, look on YouTube. There's nothing bad in it. It was fine. Um, but anyway, uh, it, was, um, it was good. It, it talks about his life and everything and, and all that good stuff. But... 
you know, uh, you can see the difference how he was very sickly. So that kind of person, if he was screaming at you or whatever and you saw that, you would just run up and you would just smack him in his knees and he'd be dead. I mean, if you were that, no, if you were a vicious guy, you would, you would take a sword and you would run up on him and you would chop his legs off. You would just break his kneecaps. That's what you would do. What's that? He wouldn't be their champion. No, he wouldn't be their champion because he'd be too weak, right? He wouldn't, he really wouldn't be. So, but Goliath wasn't like that. Goliath was a warrior. So 11 feet tall, 11 four, and a fighter and hated God, right? Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 8. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said to them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? So think about this. In that deep voice, he is screaming this across that valley. And he didn't do it for just one day. He did it for 40 days. Imagine you, some of you, you're in the army. Right? You're like Garrick's age. So you're, you're, in, the, you're in that army. And here's this guy across the way. And Saul is like being like, man, I'll do anything for people if they'll just go kill that giant. <laughs> Somebody's got to kill that giant, right? But he said, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You know, before Saul was hewing oxen and chopping them up and killing them because the Lord was with him. By the way, that's your life too. If you're not walking with God, and if you're, not, if you're walking in the flesh, you're not going to be able to face the giants either. The smallest things will discourage you, and, and, and you will leave the plain path of duty when you're not walking in the Spirit, when you're not seeking God's face. The things that you would conquer before, you, find, you will find that you will not be able to conquer at that time, right? Like Samson, and he wist not that the Lord had departed from him, right? That's the same thing. That's the same thing that happened. Uh, same example of that, right? But it, they were afraid. I mean, I could imagine being afraid when they're screaming across the valley. That, guy's, that, that, that beast is screaming at you. But in comes David. He comes on the scene, right? Unlikely. That David, unlikely that David would, you know, uh, be the one to take, take him out, right? A boy like David, right? We sing that song, Only a Boy Named David. Only, who, who sang that song? Anybody know that? Yeah, Only a Boy Named David. Do you know that song, John? You do? John knows it, right? We're going to talk about those five smooth stones at the end, but we'll save that for them. David's a type of Christ, so he comes to take a pledge of his brethren. Turn, turn your Bibles there to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I want to show you something here real quick. And verse number 17. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of, of, parch, of this parched corn, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousands. Thousand And look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. A pledge is a debt that is owed. David was sent by his father to pay it. Did you know that? That's a picture of Christ. David, Jesus was sent by the father to pay a debt that we owed, that we could not pay. David's brethren were in war. They were in war. And when you were in war, at that time, Israel did not pay their soldiers. So when you went to war, you had to find a way, if you needed food, if you needed things, you had to uh, get a pledge or you had to borrow it from somebody else to pay for it, right? That's how you had to do it. Well, Jesse uh, had his seven sons or his, his three oldest sons or whatever were off to war. And he says, listen, go to your brethren, take them some food, take them some cheese, take them some bread, uh, and then go find out if they owe any money. And if they owe it, pay it, right? That's a picture of the gospel, right? Because you and I owe a debt and God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins and to pay our debt for us, right? And he did. He said, you owe a debt that you cannot pay, right? And Jesus came to pay it. But naturally, like when Jesus came the first time, his oldest brother despised him for it. They despised him. 
First Samuel 16, 28 is the reason why we talked about that. His eldest brother heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger, that's supposed to be 17, sorry, was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiest of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You little naughty boy, go back to your sheep. David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? I preached on that a few years back. Well, a lot of years back, 10 years back probably. Then I preached it again a second time, I think. But David said that. What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Look at you all. You're all running around with your knees knocking and shaking and afraid. You don't even want to fight. And the enemies of the Lord are out there. And they're ready to devour God's people. And this whole Philistine up here, this ugly giant, this beast is up there and he is defying the armies of the living God. Is there not a cause? See, God raises up a man. God sends a man to do those things that others won't do. You know, there are, there, there are men that God sent from unlikely sources, you know, unlikely places a lot of times, and he raises them up to speak on things that others don't like. Just like in our case, uh, in the church's modern day apostasy that is going on, very few want to talk about it. Yep. Very few want to deal with their independent Baptist brethren that are teaching things that are perverse or not following the scriptures or have sold out and have done those things. And very few, but God raises up some men to do that, to challenge that narrative and to say, you know what, that's not in the Bible at all, Amen. to challenge the things that are going on. And the answer is, is there not a cause? Amen. David said, what did I do? David, notice David didn't rail on him. David didn't return railing for railing. He just said, is there not a cause? Isn't there a reason? You know, isn't there a cause to go to battle? When David talks to, to, to Saul, right? David's tired of it. He says, there's a cause. I'm going to go talk to Saul, right? I'm going to go tell Saul, I'm going to go fight this Philistine. I'm going to go fight this giant. I'm going to kill him, right? He said, he, he, he explains to him why. Look at what reason David uses here. He says, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Now, David gives the reason why, and I want to show you this here. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. You know, that's Saul didn't really care if the Lord was with David. He that was just a figure of speech to Saul. Had he cared, he'd have been following the Lord, right? But here, here what we see here, he uses past experiences to encourage him to press, press on. You know, God has given you specific victories in your life for a reason. He didn't give you those victories so you could pat yourself on the back and be happy about them. Do you understand that? He also didn't give you those victories for you to despise them and, and, and not remember them. He gave you those victories as testings and trials for you to be challenged and to be encouraged that God will see you through anything. That God will strengthen you through any of your trials that you face. That God will be with you through all of it. That I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the most dangerous times of your life, that ha has, have I not said unto thee, be strong and of good courage? Amen. That you are to fight. You're not to run from those giants. God didn't deliver you from this world and deliver you from hell and damnation and your own flesh for you to run from the challenges that are before you. He called you, and he, and he equipped you, and when he saved you, he gave you victories in your life. And it's, it's a crying shame that you ignore those victories, that you count them as very small in your eyes, and you don't praise God for them, and you don't think on them, and you're not encouraged by them, and you don't draw the encouragement that you need from those victories. Look at where you're at right now. 
Some of you, you, all of us were saved from sin and damnation and hell that were saved by the grace of God. But some of you, God brought out of the miry clay. God lifted you. God took you out of things. God fixed your problems. He fixed the challenges that were in your life. He, he gave you victory in different areas of your life. And now you're facing a Goliath and you're ready to pack it in and say, well, God's not with me anymore. I must not be a child of God anymore because there's a giant in front of me. There, there's a giant that I'm facing. So everything is null and void now. And all God did in my life is null and void now because of this that I'm facing in front of me. Got a little excited. Press the button too soon. That, but that's the truth, isn't it? We, we so easily forget all the good that God does for us, all the great things that the Lord has provided for us, how he's cared for you, how he's fed you. How vain do you have to believe to look back and say, well, I must have did all that myself. It must not have been the Lord. Why? Because you're facing a trial and it's challenging your faith and you're going to say, well, it must have just been me. Really? You're going to take credit for that? Because you know the thing that scared me the most through all my depression, anxiety and everything else that I would dare look back and I would say to God, well, God, I must have did all this and you must not have been with me. I couldn't say it. That was the one thing that God brought me down to when I was on the ground on my knees was, are you dare? Are you going to take credit for what the Holy Ghost did in your life? No, God, I'm not. Not even out of fear, I'm not. I believe you, God, and I believe you did it all. You saved my soul. You changed my life. You made me a new creature. You filled me with your spirit. You called me. You equipped me, and you've kept me. And I'm not about to take credit for that. Amen. And that's the place you have to be. That's the place you have to understand. You don't take credit for that. What did David do? David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion. It's the Lord that delivers. Well, I just can't get past my own failures. Well, you don't have to. See, God gives victory over your own failures. You need to acknowledge them and you need to trust God through them. You don't have any right not to trust God. Amen. See, you're bought and paid for with a price. You don't get to go your own way and do your own thing. You don't get to think your own way. You get that? You don't get to do that. You don't, that's not, you're already bought and paid for. You, you don't get to do that. And you definitely don't get to accept defeat. You do not get to do that. God's people are more than conquerors and they draw from their past experiences of grace that God has shown in their life. What is David giving credit to himself? He said, man, I'm just an awesome warrior. No, he said, David said, moreover, the Lord. Look at that. The Lord. You, you think maybe in your trial right now, God's trying to get you to acknowledge him, Amen. that God wants you to acknowledge him and how he gave you victory and how he is with you and how your focus is on you and it's not on him. And that seems to be the problem over and over again is that the focus always comes back to you and what you can do. And God says, no, but I'm the one that delivered you. I'm the one that called you. I'm the one that equipped you. I'm the one that saved you. I'm the one that did that. Right? I'm the one that saw you through that. So this is what David is facing, right? See that little stone up there to that head right there? Isn't that amazing? Only God could guide such. Only God could do that. But that's the point, isn't it? Isn't that what God's trying to tell us? That's the point, that it's God that guides that. It's God that does that. The impossible is what God does. It isn't, it isn't what you do. It isn't what I do. It isn't what we're able to do. It's God that does the impossible. It's God that, that enables us to do that. 1 Samuel 17, 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. You know, David, David had armor that that Saul wanted to give him. He said, here, David, take this armor and you, you wear it. And, Saul, and David's like, I can't wear that. Why? I've not proven it. That's not what God used to give me victory. By the way, the world and your friends and even others will try to give you things to help you to get, be victorious. They'll try, they'll try to give you all kinds of ideas, all kinds of thoughts of how, where your victory is going to come from. But you need to go back and remember where it did come from. Amen. That's what God showed me. You know, you don't need all these other things. You don't need all those things. 
No, when, when you're little in your own eyes, I gave you victory. There wasn't one enemy that could stand before you. There wasn't one that I allowed to defeat you, right? And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. So, so Goliath looks at him and says, and, and the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Well, actually, yeah, you are. You're a dead dog. You just don't know it yet. You're about to die. Yes, right. you are a dog. Yep. You are a beast and you're about to die. Right? That's what the Philistine said to David. Am I a dog? What are you? What do you think? I'm going to play fetch with that stick? What do you think I am? A dog that you're going to come at me and you're going to fight me with your stick? He says, yeah, you're just like, those li you're just like the lion and the bear. You're no different. Mm. By the way, it's God that delivered out of the hand of the, the paw of the lion and the bear, right? It's God that does that. It's God that delivers you too. Amen. And the Philistine said to David, and then the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. He says, so he's huffing and puffing right now, right? That's how Satan's... When they're, when they're closest to defeat, that's when, they're, that's when they're yelling the loudest, right? That they're going to destroy you, they're going to do this to you, they're going to do that to you. Come to me, he said, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. Look at this. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. Amen. Look where David said, I come to thee in the name of the Lord. You're not going to defeat Satan unless you come in the name of the Lord. You're not going to win over your battles in life unless you're doing it upon the authority of, of, the, of the name of the Lord. Amen. It's in God's name we conquer. It's in Christ we conquer. Amen. Right? There is no victory outside of Christ. If you're trying to strum up victory some other way, if you're trying to get some light in the darkness and you're trying to create your own light, it's not going to work. It, it won't work. You won't be able to do that. If you're trying to spark a flame yourself, it won't work. It's Christ that's the light of the world. He's the one that lighteth. He's the candle, and he keeps the candle lit. That's, he's the one that does that. David said, I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. See, when the enemy's a Lord, this big giant here, 11 4, he's defying God and he's screaming like a crazy beast across that valley. And David's like, all right, it's time to go. It's time to fight. Right? Screaming loud. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Imagine David running out and running towards that army. Imagine him doing that. You know, here's this small little boy, right? This slender young man compared to this mighty man, right? And he's running across that field, down, down inside there, right to the battle, hitting it head on. He's not turning around. There's no armor for the back. He has, he has his gospel armor on. He says he has the name of the Lord, which is the armor of the Lord, right? And he has that on, right? So David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistines. So here it is. All of you got to understand something. All of Israel is watching this at this time. They're all the battlefield. The king's out there. They're all watching. All eyes are on there. By the way, just like the end times when Jesus is going to return and he's going to put down the Antichrist beast system and he's going to destroy it once and for all. That new world order, he's going to crush it and he's going to destroy it. All the world will be watching, right? All eyes will be on that to see that. And David comes down a type of Christ and he comes right down there in the midst of all the enemies. David is in the midst of all of Israel who's wondering, man, how's this going to work, right? Who, who the king is there, right? King Saul. Then you have all the Philistines on the other side that are absolutely sure that this, this, this giant is going to absolutely destroy David. He is going to absolutely just annihilate David, right? But you notice the type of warfare that David has, right? David has a stone, right? He doesn't, he doesn't, David doesn't have, um, you know, he's not girded with all the swords and all the armor and everything. He's not, he, David, David is girded with the name of the Lord, right? That's really what he has. And he has these stones. That's what he has to fight with. 
David, he hasted and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slung it. Right? Just a stone and smote that Philistine in his forehead and that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Now you have to understand something. It didn't just hit him and bounce off and hurt him. That stone sunk into his forehead. That means that it penetrated that big fat skull of that giant who had a big head, right? And was a very big being. How big of a head do you think an 11 4 giant has? Big. And he stuck it right into his forehead, right in the middle of it. And it sank in there, sunk in there. So imagine when, they, when he falls to the earth right there, that stone is in the middle of his forehead, and he's dead. He is dead. He hit him in his, he hit him in his, uh, his pineal gland. <laughs> he did the Benny Hinn uh, uh, slain in the spirit, right? Smacked him a good one, didn't he? Right in the middle of his forehead, right? And down he goes, right? Right there. Imagine, here's the armies in the back thinking, oh, we got this. Here's that big old spear that's twice the size of David, right there in the middle of the forehead. You know, those that follow the Antichrist will be marked in their forehead, won't they? When people are slain in the spirit, they get slain in their forehead, don't they? So all these Pentecostal meetings, that's what they're doing. They're all hitting people in the forehead, right? They say there's a serpent in their belly, right? And they gotta get the they gotta get the baby out, they gotta wake the serpent up, they gotta the serpent's coiled down and, and hanging down in there, and they gotta get the baby out and all kinds of other things like that, right? Um, Revelation 14, 9 tells us, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. You know what? If you're not saved by the grace of God here today, that could easily be you. Right? The Bible says all the world's going to wonder after the beast. All of them are going to follow the beast. Just like they all wondered after Goliath when they saw him. And they're they're going to all wonder after the beast. They're going to follow the beast, right? Whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, right? Who are not saved by the grace of God who have not repented and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, right? They, they've not turned to Christ and trusted Him as their Lord and Savior, right? But there was a time when they came to Christ and they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? There must be a time when you've repented. You know, there's only two kingdoms in this world. There's the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Antichrist. There's the God of this world, and then there's, the, the, then there's God in heaven that reigns above all. There's the King of kings and Lord of lords, right? There's Jesus Christ who died on the cross for sinners and who was buried and who rose again from the dead, right? That in Him you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. The gospel is so simple and that from a child that was known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, amen? That from a child, right? That, that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says thou shalt be saved. The gospel is not complicated. There's only two kingdoms. Which one do you want to be in? If you desire to be in the kingdom of the Lord, then you trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. You believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You repent and put your faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation. Amen? And then the Bible says you're saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Amen. It is, it is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is calling out to Christ to save your soul. Some have done it as a child, very young. And Jesus loves to save children. Amen. Some have done it when they're old. Some have done it as a young, young man or young woman, whatever, it doesn't matter how old or when, as long as you've trusted Christ, amen? As long as you've turned to Christ and believed the gospel. I hate that term easy believism because that implies that there's hard believism. Do you understand that? 
I, I, I believe that the gospel is repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus right. Christ. Right. The only reason why you can believe is the Holy Ghost of God shows you you're lost. And he shows you to cry out to him and to believe the gospel. None of us could believe on our own accord in that sense. You did, God was searching for you long before you searched for him. Amen. You believe that, don't you? Right. Man, I do. I don't take credit for that. No, it's because I was a very spiritual person and I was looking for God. No, I'll tell you what, God tapped me a long time ago and told me I was a lost sinner. Amen. He loved us first. That's right. He loved us first before we loved him. Amen. Amen. That's the gospel. That's the death. You know, the gospel is very simple. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Right? That's going to be different for everyone as far as how that comes about and when the Lord does that in your life or when that happens, right? When you called upon the name, that's going to be different. Some people, it's going to be, they were educated, they were, they, they, or they were saved at a young age, and they, they heard the gospel at a young age, and they trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's what we want for everybody. Amen. That's my goal. That's why I'm here, amen, to see you saved young and to know Christ your whole life and to serve Him your whole life. But if not, the gospel comes to those that are older, Right? Those that, have, that are older, that have had a life of sin and, and wickedness before God, and they saw their need for the Savior, and they trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Amen? Saw their need as a lost, hell-bound sinner, deserving to go to hell. Right? I always tell people, you can't be saved until you know you're lost. Amen. Right? You have to know you're lost. You have to be shown that. Right? Many of you were shown that one day the gospel is preached to you and you realize wow that's me god's talking to me god's telling me that i'm the one that that sinned against him i'm a sinner and guilty before god right and the bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved and they trust christ as their lord and savior right that does that that there's no age requirement there amen there's no time that's a better time, but right now, amen, <laughs> if you've never done it. Right now is the time, beloved. Now is the day of salvation. If you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, never put your faith and trust in Him alone. By the way, sometimes some of you will have known a lot about the Bible, right? Some of you may know nothing when you get saved. All you need to know is that you're a sinner and you're guilty before God. And Jesus Christ came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Amen. And God will do all the teaching that you, you need after that. Amen? It's your, turn to, it's, your, it's your time to confess before God and to repent and to believe the gospel. That's as simple as it is. And a child can understand that, and an old 70-year-old can understand that, or an 80-year-old can understand that, right? Either It doesn't matter what the age is. God's going to bring those people along at different times, right? Different ages in their life when they hear the gospel and they repent and believe the gospel, right? Simple faith. Simply believing God. Amen. Amen. I like that song. Simply trusting. That is all. Amen. Amen. Simply trusting. David takes the giant's head. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. Amen. So God's going to do to all our enemies one day. Now, there are other giants. I'm going to quickly get through this. We're going to go to about 1230. I'm going to try to finish up this last portion here because I think I can make it. We're getting close, brother. We're getting close. Turn the beans down. It might be a little while, all right? 2 Samuel 21, 16. That's not the only time David faced giants. You're going to face them later in life, too. David faced giants when he was young, when he was a young man, a young believer, right? A young, but later on in his life, the giants were still around. David hadn't eradicated those giants yet. By the way, God allowed some of those to stay around for a while to prove David's kingdom, to prove that David, God was with David, right? But God's going to do the same to you. There's some challenges in your life. There's some things in your flesh. There's some things that you battle. There's some things that, that God is trying you with, right? So you learn to trust him by faith. 2 Samuel 21, 16, And Ishbianab, which was of the sons of the giant, 
the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. So he was ready to kill David. David was older at this point. He was an old man. He had been through a lot of warfare, hiding out in caves, sleeping on the cold. It gets to you right after a while. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. This was Goliath's brother. Here's Nob. Ishbi Nob's name means my seat is in Nob. So what he was saying is my authority and my seat is right here in Nob. Look where Nob is, right next to the Mount of Olives. <laughs> How about that? Boy, the devil knows where to set his people up, doesn't he? He knows where to set them up. By the way, where you have the Lord's church, you have Satan, you, you have the Lord's enemies. They're close by. They're not too far away. Those two are, but look at that right there. Here he is. He said, my seat, my authority is in Nob. But what happened? David's brother, yep. He lived a long way from death. Yes, he did. Yep. I suppose it became territorial, you know, that here's the Valley of Elah down here, and here he comes up here. Yep. He did. So you could tell they traveled, right? They fought, they warred, but he said his seat was in Nob. But I would say probably those giants did not all get along. I'm guessing if you're that big, you probably have some authority issues, and you, you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, you push your weight around and... He probably could have traveled from there because the Bible says that he sought to kill David. So he may have set his kingdom up there. Right. After, later on. He came for David, yeah, right. He yeah. wanted to kill him. Exactly. First Chronicles 20, verse 4, And it came to pass after this that there arose a war at Gezer, old Gezer, with the Philistines, <laughs> at which time Sibachai the Hushathite slew Sipia, that was of the children of the giant, and they were subdued. So Sibichai, he, was a, he slew Sipia, which has a different name also. Uh, his name was Saph also. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. That was the original Gob stopper, right? Then Sibichai, the Hushite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant, right? Right there. The, that's not the everlasting Gob stopper. That is the Gob stopper right there. Uh, he, he, that's what we would call Sibichai. He was the gobstopper. He stopped Saf there, killed him, and, um, you know, took care of business there. Uh, again, that's, that's two. There's four. Two more to go. That guy's mad. This guy's going to kill him. Not including Goliath. There's four. You're, you're, you're ruining my ending. Be quiet. I'm going to stick this on your forehead. 2 Samuel 21, 19. And there was, a, there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jeroragam, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam, just like his brother. Now, this is his mad little brother. All right? You can imagine if you killed his brother, he'd be a mad little brother. But he wasn't very little. He was actually pretty big, but not as big as his big brother. Makes sense, right? I think. Yeah. Luke, Peter, are you taller than Luke yet? No. Nope. You're still the giant brother? He's still the giant brother. Okay. Well, you would be like the little brother that came along, because that's about the perfect distance, difference in height right there, you two. So you would be the little brother that came along and was mad. First Chronicles, I'm going to teach you something about this, because, by the way, if you have the wrong Bible, you're going to get this wrong. Yep. You gotta have the right Bible, so I'm gonna show you this here. Uh, 1 Chronicles 20, verse 5. And there was a war again with the Philistines, and Alhanan, the son of Jair, slew Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, whose spear staff was like a weaver's beam. So here it doesn't tell us his name, it just says the brother. Here, Lami, Lami, whatever you want to call him, Lama if you want to, I don't care. Anyway, Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, whose spear staff was like a weaver's beam. So the brother of Goliath, but the wrong Bible, uh, many, many modern Bible versions have a giant problem. Uh, they, they say that, that Elhanan killed Goliath. Right. Well, that's a problem, because that's not what the Bible says. The, Bible, the most famous story of all is that David, what, slew Goliath, but not in the NIV. In another battle with the Philistines to Gob, Elhanan, the son of Jera Orjim, the Bethlehem killed Goliath the Gittite. Wait a minute. 
who had a, spa a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. Sounds foreign, doesn't it? And the NASV, and there was war with the Philistines again at Gob. And Elhanan, the son of Jera Origem, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite. Uh, no, he didn't. That's a giant problem, isn't it? Right? Look at this. And the ESV says, uh, And there was again a war with the Philistines at Gob. Elhanan, the son of Jera Origem, the Bethlehemite, struck down Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. All the, uh, many, not all of them, but many of the other versions all say that Elhanan killed Goliath. And then David killed Goliath. Well, you can't have it both ways. Right. You can't have it both ways. First Chronicles 20, verse 6, And yet again there was war at Gath. There was a man of great stature. This is another guy. But anyway, if you go back, to, you could do more studying on that if you want to look at that issue with the, with the modern versions and their giant problem, right? They have a giant problem. They, they, they say that David killed Goliath, and then they say that Elhanan killed Goliath, which would be, like you said, 30 years difference in the, in the time period. That would be a problem, wouldn't it? Right, because this is towards the end of David's, David's life, you know, towards the end of his, his uh, career in the battlefield, I should say. You know what I mean? So, I mean, not, not, um, not possible. But that's why the Bible version you use matters. Amen. It matters. Because you have an authority issue, right, with that problem there. So that's why we hold to the King James Bible, right? It's the inspired, infallible, perfect Word of God. And we still believe it. And by the way, some people say that, well, the, 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 well they say that that was in parentheses or they say that that was added by the translators. Right, but it has been in other manuscripts, right? It'll, and they'll say things like, "Oh, older manuscripts or other manuscripts." They'll say things like that doesn't include that, but they added it. Well, I say, "Amen." I'm fine with that. Why? Well, because that's God's book. That's why. And the English will clear up any problem you have with Hebrew or Greek. It really will. You believe that, don't you? I do. See, are you a Ruckmanite? No, I'm not. But I'm, I'm a Bibleite. I do believe that. Right? I do believe that the English made it plain and clear right there. And I, I, I really, maybe some of you, some of you guys are really smart. Some of you guys are really smart. So you could probably read Greek and Hebrew. You probably could, but I can't. So I'm just dumb enough to believe what God says in English. That's, that's, I, I, I'm not smart enough to believe you. I, you know what? Because first of all, I don't have any older manuscripts. I don't have originals either. I, I don't have those. So I couldn't tell you what the originals say. But by the way, neither could they. Because they don't have one either. That's not a true, that's not a fair argument. But anyway, so that's the problem they have. They, they, they have a major, they have a giant problem, don't they? Uh, First Chronicles 20, verse 6. And yet again, there was war at Gath. There was a man of great stature whose fingers and toes were four and twenty and six, twenty, six on each hand and six on each foot. And he also was the son of the giant. But when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, David's brother, slew him. The Bible says these were born unto the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David, by the hand of his servants. Look what it says. These four were born to the giant in Gath. They fell. David had five stones, right? Goliath and his four brothers, right? He had five stones. Say, did David know about those brothers? I don't know, but I know God did. Amen. I know that God did, and I know that God didn't do that on accident. He did that on purpose. Why is that? Some people say, well, David, those four were for his other brothers if he came. I don't know that David knew that. The Bible doesn't tell us that David knew that. But we believe God knows all things. Amen. And God set these things up. Right? Right? And no man could set this up. And let me tell you something. This is a picture of your life, friend. You don't know why some things happen sometimes in your life. And you don't know what God is doing all the time. But rest assured, God showed that He knows exactly what He's doing. And that God is going to defeat all your enemies. The last enemy being death. God is going to give you the victory over all those enemies. Over all your trials in life. And God knows the, the end from the beginning. He knows exactly what's going to happen. This story of David shows us and when David was to defeat the giants and he, that he eradicated the land. There were no giants anymore. They were gone. They were no more. The Bible speaks of them no more. Besides a verse in Job 
which talks about he runneth upon me like a giant, which was not in this time period. It was before in Abraham's time. But we see here that this, this is symbolism of, and a picture, a prophetic picture of what God was going to do. David's ministry was full of prophetic pictures. Christ is going to come and destroy that final beast kingdom. This is the last time we see the giants. David being that type of Christ, we talked about that, right? David dies a little later on, not much after this, and all the giants were destroyed. They're all gone. You know, only Christ can do that for you. As a saved person, you have a responsibility to trust the Lord. You've got to believe God through all your trials. Right? We persevere because we're preserved. But God expects us to persevere. God expects, expects us to continue on. God expects us to continue fighting the good fight of faith and trusting God through all of our trials and believing God that He hasn't changed. God doesn't change. Your feelings may change, your trials may change, your surroundings may change, your physical health may change, you, you, you will have, your, your um, emotions are going to change, your sorrows may be great, your grief may, be, may, may fill your heart, you may be overcome with sorrow and sadness and everything else, but God is still the same God. He's still the same God that promised. He's still the same God that anointed David and, and, in, and led David to take those five stones out of that brook. He's the same God that did that. And He's the same God that is working all things according to His will in your life. Right? The Bible says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. You and I work out what He worked in. And He is continuing to work in. And that He will perform it under the day of Christ. This is proof positive that when David uh, went the way of all the earth and he died, that all his enemies, all those enemies were defeated. All those giants were gone. And he rid the land of them. That God gave the victory, and the final victory was David's death. That he would pass on, and he would go home to be with the Lord, and he would be finished. You and I have a short time to prove our love to God. We have a short time to, to face these giants down, to fight the good fight of faith. We, we have a short time to do that. By the way, we also, it's imp the other thing that I would add is, remember that sword that David had? I think it's interesting that when he talked about that sword, later on that sword that he took from Goliath and he put in his tent, right? He put that armor and that sword in his tent. Later on, that sword would be with the high priest and David would take that sword and he would use it. He said, give me that one, there is none like it which is a picture of that, uh, of the, our, our Bible, the King James Bible, right? Give me that one. There's none like it. There's Amen. no sword like it on this earth, right? This is the only one. This is the one, right? This is, this is God's Word right here. This is the inspired, infallible, and perfect Word of God right here. And this is the one, and David knew that, right? And I think it's interesting how there's that challenge there with Goliath about who slew Goliath, right? And the confusion that is there and say, oh, it must be an error in the Bible. No, it's an error in your brain. Amen. God gives the victory and God shows that. And you know what? If you'll trust the Lord, He'll give you victory in every area of your life. You've got to trust Him. You gotta, if you're going to defeat those giants, it's God that gives the grace. But you know what? You and I have to fight. We can't just roll over and die. We've got to be up and we've got to fight. We've got to trust the Lord. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your words. Thank you for... Uh, the truth of them. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for your grace in our lives. Lord, be with your children. Please strengthen them. Help them to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. If there be one or two here that we know that are not saved, Lord, that have never come to Christ, that they would trust you today and be saved by the grace of God. Repent and put their faith and trust in Christ alone, his death, burial, and resurrection. Thank you so much for dying for us. Thank you so much for being buried and rising from the dead to give us victory. And Lord, thank you that you'll take us all the way home someday to be with you. Lord, bless the food to our bodies. Bless the time we have together. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.